Welcome to St. James Lutheran Church in downtown Portland as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the Christian Church, the arrival of God's Holy Spirit. And like the altar behind me, I hope you are wearing red today. I'm Pastor David, and today in worship we move from the prayer appointed for the Festival of Pentecost to hymn number 396, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness. Then a reading of the events of the day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2, followed by Romans 8 reading. Here you're going to hear nine voices in nine languages. Then my sermon titled, The Day Everyone Showed Up. And finally, a beautiful organ piece by Michael Linder on our organ. I must say we continue to listen to the governor and to the, our bishop about when churches can open their doors again, and the second I know, I'll let you know. Thank you for your offerings, and thanks also to Karn and Ed and Martha and Gary and Michael for their work in helping make this worship possible for all of us. And I also want to invite you to join us at 1030 on Sunday mornings for our virtual coffee hour. Last week, over 40 of us got together. It was so good to see each other. Now, on this festival day, will you pray with me? O oh God, on this day you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us the Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice at all times in your peace. We pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear our opening hymn.
Hear now these words from Acts, the second chapter, the story of the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, Ah, they are simply filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Now hear our Romans text. Nine voices, nine languages, nine people. Similar to that first Pentecost day. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit bearing witness we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. On this Pentecost Sunday, we crash headlong into history. To explore this with you, I want to use some of the themes of Will Williman. He's a, a theologian, the former dean of the chapel at Duke, and a bishop in the Methodist Church. His words and his insights are rich, and you will hear some of them. But be warned, this sermon requires one thing of you and of me, that for a moment today, you and I might be willing to embrace our past, both good and bad, both joyous and challenging. I will, if you will. As you just heard me read, it was Pentecost Day in Jerusalem, 
The Holy Spirit swept in like a Midwest twister, like the sound of a mighty wind, and everything went flying. Everything, everything, everything went flying, especially old ideas of what it meant to follow God. The Old Testament idea of God only working through a select particular chosen people called the Hebrews, that idea was caught in the Pentecost twister and landed in a tree in the next county. No, rather the birthday of the church blew through like, like blowing out candles on the church's birthday cake. The breath of fresh air caused the apostles to share the good news of Jesus in every language, to every race, even to people like us with a wind-swept past. What? Yes, even people with a history were part of God's family. In a recent book, Christopher Leitch says that one enduring characteristic of Americans is our belief in progress. Progress that has no goal other than progress as a goal in and of itself. Our progress is the belief that it really is possible to be over and done with our past. Most of the rest of the world knows better than this. We may think that we are over and done with our past, but our past has a way of not being done with us. Think about it for a moment today especially with this pandemic. There is something called contact tracing. It's being used now, even. And people will want to know with whom you interacted. How about over the past week or over the past few months? Who have you touched? Who have you walked by? And suddenly we realize that our history catches up with us. The past came back. History is not so easily eradicated. As one commentator said of our troubles today, we have marched forward from the 2020 pandemic to the 1918 so-called Spanish flu pandemic. Now is that really progress? We do have a history like it or not, we are tied to our history. And in this technological age, sometimes we think we can out-compute it or label it as obsolete or call it a dinosaur or simply upgrade our history, deleting anything that doesn't smell quite right. We say, well, it doesn't really integrate with our other programs. And yet one of the reasons we feel so lonely so much on our own is that we don't tell stories about our ancestors. Our great-grandparents don't know us, and we don't know them, which means that most of us are pretty much on our own in the world. There's nobody left to tell us which path to take or how to get over our failures or how to put up with one another. Someone has noted that in a technological society, there's nothing for our ancestors to teach us. We don't listen to old people because technology makes the elderly ignorant. My five-year-old grandchild knows more about computers than I'll ever know, says a grandparent. And in an agricultural society, Older people had all the secrets to how to plant the seed and when to harvest and to make a chair and how to lay a fire. Technology gives us the impression that children know more than anybody. After all, no one over 40 can figure out how to even use Zoom. Well, I'll speak for myself. Will Williman says that maybe we speak actually too positively about our ancestors. If there is one thing worse than having no history, it's having too much history. If there is one thing worse than not being able to remember, it's not being able to forget. George Will, the commentator, said of the Balkans once, here is a part of the world that has produced more history than it can consume. In some measure, that applies to all of us, I suspect. 
we have made more history than most of us can handle. My mom, I remember, would often talk about her loving family, her Swedish ancestry, her Finnish ancestry. She would go on and on about how they still today live on the farm that they've been on since 1732, attend church every Sunday, except they don't. And then I'd turn to my dad and ask about his history and his relatives, his ancestors, and he'd mumble something about, well, I think they were all horse thieves. How much of your painful past have you tried to airbrush out? Who among our ancestors no longer stands on the balcony with us, waving at the future, because we have no means of dealing truthfully with our past? People of God, that's why we have Pentecost. Because on this day, not only does God's Spirit welcome us, but God also welcomes our baggage, our past, our ancestors, our history. The accepting Spirit of God sweeps through our history today. Let go of the guilt and the shame and the sacred silence. Pentecost has come and it's coming in roaring like a wind. There at Pentecost in the story, Jews from every nation under heaven were gathered, Acts, the second chapter tells us. Every nation on earth had somebody there at Pentecost. Every nation, including strange nations with strange-sounding, difficult-to-pronounce names like Persians and Cappadocians, Medes and Elamites, Mesopotamians. This roll call of nations here at Pentecost is usually taken to mean that the people from everywhere were there, people of every tongue and tribe. The fractured, alienated people of the earth, broken in so many different languages and cultures, just like up the Tower of Babel on that day. And suddenly they were all healed when the Spirit descended on Pentecost. That's how you and I usually interpret this story. But according to a Lutheran, a professor by the name of Tom Long, he took a look at Pentecost and this assemblage and realized that it was not only a diverse ethnic gathering, Medes and Persians and Elamites and Cappadocians, but it is also an historically impossible gathering. Those Medes that were there at Pentecost would have had a tough time getting to Jerusalem from Mesopotamia, not just because they would have had to travel a few hundred miles, but because they would have had to travel a couple of hundred years as well. The Medes had been extinct long gone from the face of the earth for at least two centuries. And those Elamites, well, they were mentioned back in Ezra, the second chapter, but not again. The Elamites were also lost in the past. See, we have here a gathering of people not only from the north and the south, but also from the living and the dead. Put in today's language, it would go something like this. Oh, you should have been there on Pentecost. We had a huge number of visitors for the service. Some were all the way from Montana. There were people from Arizona and Michigan, not to mention a whole van load of Assyrians and a couple from, from uh, 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 Babylonia. And, oh, and a nice Hittite couple who asked to be baptized. This strange, playful story is Acts' way of saying that when God's Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, it was poured out not just on a few, but on all. It was given not just to a people who spoke Hebrew and happened to be living in Jerusalem in the first century. It was given to people who spoke Cappadocian, given to people of every century and every place. We were there that day at Pentecost. It was like all our past 
the ancestors who we lovingly remember as well as the ones we try to forget. The events out of our history we commemorate with monuments as well as the ones we try to sweep under the carpet. Everything was caught up, brought back, remembered, blessed, redeemed by God's Spirit. That day at Pentecost, we were all there. We were given the means to remember our past, to sit at table with our ancestors. Pentecost doesn't mean that everyone has this gift. It claims that the church has been given the holy means of remembrance to tell the mighty acts of God as well as the silly and sometimes sordid acts of humanity. It means that this promise is to you and to your children that we are able to get together with our history, that our ancestors, even the ones who we attempt to forget, to airbrush into our collective amnesia, that all those forgotten voices and excluded people get included, invited to the table. God's blessed, forgiving, empowering, liberating spirit was given to us and to our parents. We were all there. It was the day that everyone showed up. So now, remember a moment ago the hymn you heard? Listen to these words from that hymn. You call, Spirit, from tomorrow. You break ancient schemes. From the bondage of sorrow, all the captives dream dreams. Our women see visions. Our men clear their eyes with bold new decisions. Your people arise. The Spirit has come. It's Pentecost. A blessed Pentecost to you all. <laughs>